Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, connecting new money with old money since 2018. And by Change Now, a limitless crypto exchange. Cake Wallet, Sweetwater Digital, and Change Now are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tooman interviews Andrew Henderson, the founder of Nomad Capitalist, a service that helps people go where they are treated best. The two discuss how he became the Nomad Capitalist, his opinion on Monero and his interest in learning more about it, crypto in general as a tool of opting out of the traditional financial system, what crypto-friendly locations one can consider going to, his concern of the volatility and regulations of crypto in the States, as well as where he sees crypto and the Nomad Capitalist movement trending to. Monero Talk starts now. Okay. Good morning, Andrew. Or I don't know. I don't know what time it is where you are. Where are you? We just say hello. Uh, <laughs> in the Republic of Georgia. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Awesome, man. So you're you're literally living the dream. You know, I, I say that to a lot of people, but you know, it's just kind of a figure of speech. But uh, you are you are actually living the dream. I feel like you're you're one of these guys that figured out how to uh, opt out. Um, um, Seemingly, uh, uh, before most people have, you know, I feel like a lot of people are working on that now. I think you're one of the, the early adopters to uh, opting out. Yeah, I, mean, I was talking about some of this stuff in my family um, in the 90s. I mean, my parents had talked about, uh, you know, uh, other countries that could be better places to live. Uh, back in the 90s, we would read like the list of uh, best places to be born and the uh, economic freedom index around the dinner table when I was 12 years old, 13 years old. And it's like, oh, the U.S. slipped another spot uh, where I grew up, the U.S. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, my journey to become a nobody capitalist was very interesting because uh, I started a business in uh, the 2000s when I was like 19 years old. And it started doing pretty well in my early 20s. And, uh, Tax bills, you know, wasn't so theoretical anymore. I think a lot of people have had very theoretical frustrations with the government. Uh, and now it's uh, the rubber's meeting the road. And I saw that myself 15 years ago, almost. And I think people are seeing it now. So, so it's not random that you became the nomad capitalist. It was, it was through your life experience that you found your way there. I had, a, I had the great fortune. You know, I... Um, First of all, I inherited nothing. I was given nothing. I think that that's a great fortune in and of itself. I was forced to do things on myself. But what I did get was a great wealth of knowledge. I was surrounded growing up by people who were, you know, somewhat successful, at least had a success mindset. Nobody I was surrounded with growing up was, you know, oh, woe is me. You know, you can't get ahead. What are you going to do? People, you know, in general felt pretty empowered. Uh, and so I got a great permission slip above that from my parents when my father said, listen, you should go where you're treated best when you get older. You know, it is your obligation to yourself, your family, what have you, to not have to stay and take care of your parents. Because there was a discussion among some of my friends about how you know, their parents were relying on their kids to take care of them in old age. And my parents said, no, no, no. You need to go where, you, where you're treated best, whether that's the same city, the same state, the same country, you know, country or not. Uh, and I think that all put together... Uh, was really a great uh, upbringing in terms of how to conduct yourself. And I guess we should, for those who are, are listening on my end, on um, Monero Talk, a little bit of a background of exactly what it is you do now. You essentially consult people on this concept of, of opting out, of becoming their own nomad capitalist. Is that, is that accurate? 
so what I would say we do is we not only put out a lot of free resources, but we do help people who are at the seven or eight or nine or 10 figure level who want help uh, the way that I would have wanted help again, almost 15 years ago now when I was starting to research this stuff, you know, how do I find someone to help me get out of where I am, get into somewhere new, um, handle everything that comes along with that, all the infrastructure, whether it's banking, residence, citizenship, you know, I got to sell my house and all the little things that people don't think about. You know, if you, if you give up your U.S. citizenship, for example, very extreme thing to do, but people are looking at doing that. I did it. Uh, what are the things that change? Can you keep your house in the U.S.? Do you have to sell it? You know, what are the new? I mean, there's so many little things out there that I wish someone would have advised me on. And so I've kind of learned this the hard way and I've dealt with people and, and found the right people after finding the wrong people. So we help uh, seven and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors uh, get their residence and citizenship, you know, create their plan B or a plan A for many crypto investors. Um, you know, diversify their finances, get out of the tax net and uh, find a place they can run to uh, rather than running from something. So let, let's, uh, if you don't mind, can we, can we use me as kind of the, uh, the test case here? Uh, yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, 100% crypto, 100% Monero in particular. I don't know if you're familiar with Monero. We could yeah. talk about it a little bit if you're not. Um, I, you know, I, I currently have my nine to five job here, uh, thinking of going, uh, leaving that and uh, working on my Monero projects full time. I have the Monero talk show, uh, which you're currently on. Uh, we're slowly growing that. Um, I also have this business called Gratuitous that we started. Uh, it started as a, as a coffee business, a mail order coffee business uh, where we ship you coffee from Guatemala. Uh, the unique thing being when you get the coffee, it comes with a QR code on it where you can send a, a Monero tip and it goes directly to the farmers, the workers where the coffee came from. We went down to uh, Guatemala. We, we taught them about Monero. Uh, and so we're, we're slowly building that up, adding new products. Uh, long story short, uh, my dream would be to, you know, to uh, work on these, uh, what started as hobbies, uh, turn them into real businesses. And they're slowly becoming that. Uh, work on them full time, leave the nine to five, uh, and potentially become, uh, I guess, what you would call a nomad capitalist. So, um, what what uh, what places would you advise me to to start looking at, or perhaps things I should start researching uh, towards that goal of opting out of the nine to five, working on these on these projects, and perhaps being a, a, a global citizen uh, in a in a place or in multiple places where I guess I would be treated best, as you would say, in terms of somebody who's 100 uh, percent Monero. Well, we see you know, we've done almost a thousand of these very high level boutique, you know, four to six, eight week uh, you know, projects with people. No one of them is the same. Uh, they all have little different things, even if they're similar. Uh, and so I think that, you know, that's worth considering. There are thousands, tens of thousands of different permutations you can you can play with. Now, what I first notice is you're 100 percent crypto, but you have a job. So you have an income that I presume comes in in, in fiat currency into a bank account. That could be helpful if you're looking for a place to go, because here's the challenge when you say 100 percent crypto. We've been dealing with this and there are some countries that are more friendly than others. Vanuatu has talked about allowing agents to accept crypto and then convert that and pay the government. Challenge is Vanuatu's citizenship program is really not as robust as I would like it to be. But um, that's just one example. Um, what you're going to want to do is if you're going to get a residence permit, get a citizenship, go somewhere else, you know, get a tax residence um, if you're not an American is you know show i have some kind of income or i have some kind of wealth so the business could be helpful bureaucrats may or may not understand depending on the country what the business is about they do understand nine to five and so if you want to go to let's say a latin american country many of them revolve around um how much income do you make and many of them are pretty flexible on hey you know nine to five job a few are like we really want a pension or an annuity but a lot of them okay you have a job and if you're living in the u.s or any western country you're probably going to have enough income to qualify so that stands out to me immediately. On the 100% crypto, certainly we're going to want to look at options in terms of citizenship. If you're going to get a backup citizenship, especially if it's by investment, that are going to allow you to, um, to use that and to use crypto as a source of funds. And so a lot of the, the programs don't allow that. Um, so that's the first thing I would look at. Now, what we don't want to do is we don't want to have the tail wake the dog where, you know, we move to Belarus, for example, because they have a good tax regime for this. If that's not where you want to live. What I would look at is diversifying where I'm going to say, OK, I've got a company that sounds like that exists, um, you know, in the, the world outside of crypto. I'm in the coffee business. 
Um, you know, number one, I'm gonna look at the supply chain. What are the tax issues on that? Am I shipping it directly from Guatemala? That's good. If I'm shipping it from a warehouse in the US, for example, that's not as good. So, um, you know, we want to analyze that, but I would put that company somewhere overseas that uh, if you're accepting payments in crypto, maybe we can get an exchange and you can then move that off the exchange. Um, but I would look at a different jurisdiction probably than when I'm, where I'm going to live. Um, you look at a crypto friendly place like Portugal. I don't want to incorporate in Portugal. Um, and if you have an actual business outside of crypto, that's going to you know, trigger extra kind of permanent establishment issues. And the business has to be somewhere else, but it has to be in a whitelisted jurisdiction. So, you know, Portugal could be interesting if you like that kind of environment. The UAE is increasingly interesting. I mean, obviously, El Salvador and some of the Central American countries have become more interesting. Um, it really depends on how you want to live. Um, I think that you can also simply go to countries where they don't tax, or they don't tax your foreign income, or they don't tax you, or you have a tax exemption, and either live there full time or divide your time between numerous countries. So when I look at where do I go as a crypto investor, I don't necessarily think that I have to go to places where they're madly in love with crypto. I have to go to places where they're going to leave me alone whether they've established that um, through the, you know, a special exemption for crypto like a Belarus or whether they've established that through lack of legislation like a Portugal or whether they just have generalized tax laws that leave you alone. And then, of course, there's the personal side, you know, where are you just going to be personally left alone? And right now, I think that's uh, Mexico and Central America, parts of Northern South America, um, and it's Eastern Europe. Those are the places that I think are going to leave you alone. And they happen to have some of those countries, good tax policies. Mm. So obviously, uh, it's it's not a simple answer. It's got to be tailored to uh, who the person is, right? There's there's no there's no uh, really top three places to move to as as somebody who's 100 percent crypto. You don't really. Yeah. Know. A lot of people like Portugal, for example. That's a popular place. I also have a number of people who are in Dubai. Um, I have a couple people who are moving to Costa Rica with it. Um, but I don't know that, yeah, that there are top places. There are places that are perhaps very crypto friendly. You know, Liechtenstein has been talked about as crypto friendly. Practically impossible to immigrate to Liechtenstein under the conditions that you or I would want to go to. Um, so that's just not going to work as well. So I think that you have to balance the tax impact, the immigration ability, um, which, by the way, for some people could just be a tourist. You could be in a different country every month or every two months. And you know, COVID aside, all these travel restrictions aside, depending on your passport, you know, potentially you just you just you know have no fixed home. Uh, but you know, tax, immigration, and then just personal freedom and lifestyle. Where do you want to go? I happen to like cities. I am looking more to places like Ecuador, for example, where I think they leave you alone. Um, taxes aren't perfect um, if you're living there full time. But you know, I'm looking at okay, let me give me some space where I can just be be left alone. Uh, but in general, you know, if you're someone who doesn't like that kind of atmosphere, then that's obviously not going to work for you. Yeah, this is all, you know, uh, very theoretical for me at this point. I mean, uh, a, a major wrinkle I left out is you know, I have a seven year old daughter who's pretty well planted here in New York, New York. Her mother lives here as well. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm not the type of guy who could uh, just completely completely uh you know pick up and leave uh um i'm grounded for those purposes so my ideal situation perhaps would be one where uh, i would be coming back and forth as easy as possible uh perhaps bringing my daughter with me for months at a time to places you know in the summer um so yeah i mean obviously there you know uh everybody's situation is is different um what do you think of uh I often hear Puerto Rico spoken about as a place. Uh, so obviously, it's essentially part of the United States. What's your opinion of Puerto Rico with regards to being a crypto friendly place and how people can work that into their their lives? Well, I think what Puerto Rico is, is it's been a place for people who like the idea of what you said. Hey, it's part of the U.S. and it feels comfortable. All right. I mean, people for some reason have a they have this great comfort moving from Los Angeles down to Orange County uh, when, you know, crime goes up, for example. And then they'll move from Orange County to Las Vegas for the state income tax. OK, that's not a big deal. Then they'll move to Florida because it's more open or whatever. But some reason, you know, Puerto Rico is kind of like one step more where it's like, eh, all right, it's kind of in the U.S. I don't understand fundamentally the difference between moving to Puerto Rico, Panama, Portugal, et cetera. Now, what Puerto Rico gives you is as of right now, you know, 0% on your crypto based on, you know, when you go in, you, you figure out what your value is. I'm taking the assumption, you know, I am the goody two shoes of the offshore business. I know some people in Monero uh, think that that's uh, not the point. 
Uh, but I'm just going to assume that we're, you know, checking the boxes because I don't want to be a criminal. I'm no longer a U.S. citizen. I no longer fill out the forms. But, you know, check the box. Do you have crypto, et cetera? Um, so it offers the tax benefits. It offers someone in your position, perhaps the lifestyle of um, you have a child. You know, I don't have to get immigration benefits. I don't have to sign up for an immigration program um, because I can just go there. Um, I can sign up for the, the tax program. Now, they're talking about, you know, making it more expensive. They've already raised a bunch of the fees. Um, they're talking about putting in a, a, a low uh, double digit tax rate on things like crypto. Um, so, I mean, that could be good or that could be bad. It had to be how you look at it. You know, are, why are they changing the program? Um, I, I think the access back into the U.S. Um, is good. And I would say this, if I'm in crypto and I plan on having lots of passive gains, so you have a business which is easier to mitigate taxes on overseas. Not as easy as it once was, but still easy. If I'm in crypto and I just go and live in Portugal, Portugal may give me some benefits, but as the U.S. is going to follow me with an extraterritorial tax system, that's where I would look at Puerto Rico because my choice is basically Puerto Rico, renounce my citizenship, or possibly if I have some kind of active business arrangement, I can use that. There aren't that many other choices um, unless you get into really kind of niche, niche offerings. So Puerto Rico works in that you don't have to, you know, if you're just a passive investor, get into or, or earning income from trading, things like that. You don't have to get into the tax issues. You go down there and pay a low rate of tax. It's possibly going up. It's still much lower than the U.S. You don't need to sign up for residence programs. Um, I still think someone who's in crypto needs a second passport. You never know when the winds could change. And my fundamental issue is, can you trust the U.S. government? Um, do you want to continue living in the U.S.? I think there's lots of opportunities all around the world. I think there are countries that are more interested in, in adopting new technologies. I met with the president, uh, former president of here in, in Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili. This guy wants to, to slash and burn everything, practically taxes and regulations. Um, so I want to go to places where guys like him are in charge rather than sticking around. Um, but I do understand people are not all going to move. And Puerto Rico offers a softer landing. Um, uh, I happen to have some trust issues. And I, you know, at the time when I made the decision not to go, there was a single person who, you know, wanted to have the world, uh, the social world available to me. So it can work. Um, I think it's more of a fallback, but it certainly works for some people. When did you renounce your U.S. citizenship? How long has that been? been about four years. And so uh, what, is, what is the process? I mean, I mean uh, if you can describe it briefly. I mean, there's a lot of there are a lot of things involved. Number one, you need to figure out, you know, what's your tax situation. And if you can do so, you know, it's always better to have less money than more money. Um, you basically, you know, there's some forms to handle. Right now, the challenge is uh, we have people who are nonstop, you know, finding U.S. embassies uh, that are open, uh, that are accepting renunciation appointments. There are about 10 or 12. Um, so people are contacting us. They can't even find one. So that's an issue. Uh, you go in, you have a series of appointments and you uh, Basically, they'll they'll tell you here's what you get, here's what you don't get. You know, you don't get out of criminal prosecution, you don't get out of civil, you know, lawsuits. It's, it's not a magic wand of any kind, other than you're not a citizen and you're no longer bound to taxes or regulations or any of the things like that. Um, nor do you get to keep your passport, all that. Um, so they'll they'll you'll go through those couple of appointments. You know, you'll you'll pay two thousand three hundred and fifty dollars. You'll sign that you're you're out, and then they'll they'll basically process your renunciation. Um, now, for, for tax and financial purposes, basically when you do it is the time that counts, but then they do take some time to process it. And you finally get a certificate that you're no longer a U.S. citizen. And so you need some other citizenship. There are a few people who are stateless. Life is rather difficult. I even talked to, to President Saakashvili about his brief experience being stateless. Um, it's not easy, right? And so I wouldn't recommend it uh, to most people. Uh, so you're going to want that second passport first. Um, but that is the process. And, uh, you know, they've made it more difficult, unfortunately, right now under the banner of uh, COVID. And being stateless is difficult mainly because it's, it becomes difficult to, to travel because you don't essentially you don't have a passport. You know, yeah, I, I, I like that of opting out of the system. I think the most extreme ways of opting out of the system just it, it, it's, it's so much of an inconvenience that it, that it negates the benefits. And so, sure, can you go and get a stateless person's document? Sure. I mean, again, the, the story that, that uh, President Saakashvili mentioned in his interview with me was, uh, uh, you know, when you go to apply for a, a U.S. visa, there's no code. There's no code for like, you know, XXY or whatever, whatever it is for a stateless person. You know, how do you get an appointment to even get a visa? Um, 
And so, uh, you know, people at the airport aren't going to know what to do with it. Um, so, yeah, it's difficult to travel. Now, not everyone wants to travel. I understand that. Some people just want to go and live in Ecuador or in Paraguay or live in wherever and just be left alone. And that's fine. Um, of course, if things change in that country, you know, where are you going to go? I like to I like to have diversity. I like to have a little bit of everything, um, not, not even for tax reasons, but just to enjoy life. And I think it becomes very difficult in that situation. Have has there been any negative consequences uh, that you felt from renouncing your U.S. citizenship? Oh, not particularly. I mean, I think people need to understand, um, depending on what your other citizenships are, you know, how you're going to get back into the U.S. I think people seem to, to believe, including many Americans, oh, well, you're just coming back for a wedding, right? Well, no, you're either allowed to come back or you're not. Um, and so if you're British, I mean, easier than if you're, uh, you know, Zombian, for example. Right. So you want to take all these things into mind, um, you know, but I think some people don't really need to return to the U.S. Right. I mean, and for me, my perspective is this. All right, I just saw an article today. Homeschooling is reaching record levels. You know, if people can homeschool in California or Florida. They can homeschool anywhere. Uh, you know, if, if you have family that uh, wants to see you, you know, I, my family, uh, where did I meet them last? Uh, uh, Mexico, I think. And we've had. You know, Christmases in Mexico, we've met in various places around the world. You know, my family can afford to do that. Uh, if they couldn't, I could afford to fly them in. Um, and so I think that there are some pretty simple solutions, you know, um, to solving any of those problems. Did, it, did you have a lot of hesitation when you were going to do it? I mean, it's, uh, it, was there a process there mentally when you decided to renounce your U.S. US citizenship or was it just... Yeah. When I'm ready, I'm doing this. I mean, what, what was the, the mental process there? You bring up a good point, right? And this is part of what I wish would have existed 15 years ago is, you know, I, I think it's important when I'm talking to someone to understand there is an emotional side to it, uh, even if uh, we don't always want to admit that. It's never an easy decision. I, I made the decision and I got it done, the whole, whole process in about three weeks. Um, and I said, you know, things aren't going to get any better. I've been thinking about this for many years. Uh, let me just do it now. And I had a round table of people, some who were just long-term friends and family, others who were in this business. You know, I'm in the business and I've been living overseas for a number of years. I had purposely been avoiding coming back to the U.S. or even flying through the U.S. I just found it to be very annoying. Um, so it was a pretty quick decision. That said, and I was just talking to a guy the other day. He said, I want to renounce. I've never been outside of the country. OK, I mean, let's talk about, you know. He's saying it's entirely for tax. For me, it was never entirely about for, you know, for me, the, the, the earliest things were just the culture, both as an entrepreneur, um, as a guy, um, as someone who didn't quite feel like this is, these are my people. Um, that was my first motivation. And then where Nomad Capitalist started was kind of explaining, uh, you know, how you would save tax by leaving the U.S., um, just even by leaving the country physically, but staying a citizen. So, uh, you know, for me, I knew what I was getting into. But if someone is not experienced in that, I mean, let's be honest, the world is different. Um, I don't know why you would leave the U.S. to go and live in the U.K., for example. I mean, there are some people with, with, with the tax incentives that can do it. But like, why would you go live in Australia? Why would you go and live in you know, Canada? To me, that's not an improvement. That's going to give you exactly perhaps what you have or some level of similarity. But I would suggest, you know, going further afield. And I think you probably should take some time to get used to that. So my suggestion to someone in your position is even if you're not ready to physically move, uh, maybe you get a residence permit somewhere. Uh, maybe you get citizenship somewhere. Go to that country. Travel on that passport. Uh, I told people, I mean, you're 100 percent crypto, but I've said go and open a bank account with 500 bucks here in Georgia. Put it in there and then go use the ATM card and feel comfortable with it. Um, you know, do those things, get that experience in, start to build your your muscles internationally so that if something bad does happen, you're going to do it. Because I'll tell you, I just put out a, a video yesterday on our YouTube channel. Uh, we put out a video a day and I said, more Americans than ever in a poll are saying they're going to take up arms and fight. I've said from day one, I'm not stay and fight. And, and people want to criticize me for that. There's a whole contingent of, you know, patriots, quote unquote, that want to criticize me. Here's how I read it. They feel helpless and hopeless. They don't know what to do. If you feel helpless and hopeless, you're not going to you're never going to take action. I mean, the walls could literally be closing in on you and you're going to be like any other person in history who just sticks around thinking, yeah, it can't get that much worse. So getting that experience to me uh, under your belt, that worldliness, that comfort 
uh, is probably an important factor in driving um, a decision like that. Let's uh, let's talk about crypto a little bit. So um, obviously, like like we said, you've you've been thinking about opting out uh, before. It, it was the cool thing to do. Uh, you were thinking about it in the '90s, and then you you actually went and and figured it out. You spent you've literally spent your whole life uh, thinking about these concepts. Uh, crypto is now here, and it's created. Uh, what, what I would describe as, uh, you know, a one click button way of opting out, right? Kind of without even picking up and leaving and going anywhere. You could, you could opt out from the, from the comfort of your, of your current home and country, uh, essentially by moving your, your fiat dollars into crypto and, and in many ways, uh, essentially opt out. What is, what is your a take on that? What is your opinion of crypto in general? Do you see it as that type of tool? Is, do you look at it that way? I would, I would just love to hear you talk about crypto yeah. in, the, in those terms. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan. And you know, I have a lot of friends in the space. I've gotten into the space. I mean, I've had people. Um, you know, we, we first were taking crypto as payment back in 2013 for some stuff. And I should have hold on, held on to more of it. So over time, I've gradually become more and more. Uh, comfortable with it and a fan of it. We work with obviously a lot of crypto people right now, and so I have a great respect for uh, you know people taking risks. That's that's where I come from is is respect for risk taking. Now I suppose a lot of people say, well, there's not much risk. Look at what they're look at what the Fed is doing. Look at what's happening in the world. I, I'm not a 100% crypto guy um, for numerous reasons. Um, you know, number one, I like owning homes around the world. So that's a, you know, afforded me residence and citizenship benefits that I think are worthwhile insurance policies and lifestyle benefits. I like to be in control of where I live. So I don't want to live in Airbnbs. We did that many years ago. I don't want to rent an apartment with some uh, Malaysian landlord or whatever it is that I'm living. Uh, I want to have some level of, of control. And I think if you live in places where the government allows you to have control along with your local community, your local neighbors, um, that's a good investment. Um, and I, you know, make other investments and do other things with money. And I run a business, and uh, you know, our treasury policy is not 100% crypto, but it is, you know, somewhat. So I'm a big fan. Uh, I think that, you know, what I've said about nomad capitalist and really the nomad movement is that uh, for about five years, I've said you're going to see increasing fragmentation. Where you know, I'm speaking to um, the seven and eight figure and up. Uh, people who want to become nomadic, whether that's living in Dubai full time or whether that's you know having homes around the world. Um, there's also obviously people who are living in co-living spaces and who are collaborating and bootstrapping new businesses. There are people who are freelancers who are you know traveling around the world from air, one Airbnb to the other. I mean, there's so many different areas in this space. I think you're going to see the same thing as you see crypto adoption widen. Uh, you see the same kind of thing. You're going to find people. Um, you know, like the, like myself and others I work with who they've got 100 million bucks and 20 million of it's in crypto. And uh, they figure, listen, maybe crypto will be 50 percent of the net worth at some point or, you know, or 90 percent. Who knows? But um, you're also going to find the, the maxi. So I think there's a room under the tent for everybody. Um, you know, my perspective is is wanting to be diversified in many different ways. Uh, but I think it's really been a great thing. Where do you where where do you see it going? I, um, obviously, I, I assume you think that crypto adoption is is going to grow. Um, what, what's your what's your take on the future of crypto and, and where it fits in? You know, I'm I'm not a I'm not a great prognosticator in this area. I think it's interesting because certainly the more adoption you're going to have. I mean, look again back when I was you know in the, in the 90s, we were talking in 1994 about this stuff, and uh, my father said he said. Uh, you know, this, is, this internet's pretty libertarian these days. Is that eventually it's just going to become a mirror of general society once once you have wider adoption? I think there's a certainly a fear of of how that looks. Sure, um, it's great to have Visa and all these other people involved. You know, how is that going to drive people calling for regulation? You see, Mark Cuban, who I don't know the entire story, but but got into a bind with a crypto investment and then you know goes south and calls for regulation. Um, you know, certainly I think that, you know, you're not going to have anything that has mass adoption. That's the wild, wild west. But, you know, where's the uh, where's the happy medium? I don't entirely know. Uh, certainly, you know, it's if you look at, you know, crypto compared to gold and silver, I do have some belief in gold and silver as something tangible, but it's you know, performed terribly compared to crypto. So, I mean, the results speak for themselves. Um, you know, I, my, my concern, though, is um, you know what happens when you get that mass adoption uh you know listen, i'm in our i'm in this space i'm in the offshore space and we have people my, my mission 10 years ago 
was I'm going to have a real name and a real face, which a lot of people are doing now, but nobody was doing that back in 2012. It was like a bunch of guys with fake names and pen names and shrouded, you know, men of mystery. And uh, I said, we're going to bring people into the tent who, who always thought this was dodgy. We're going to bring in the Amazon seller who bootstrapped a business that's now worth $10 million, had a C-safe tax. Well, when you do that, certainly you're going to invite more regulation. You're going to see what we've seen with numerous residents and citizenship programs, which is higher prices. Um, you know, the more people that are in the tent, it does bring other consequences. I think overall it'll be a net positive, but, you know, it's worth considering that. And can you expand that a little bit more? You're saying so as as adoption grows, what, what is essentially the point you're making there? I'm not sure. Well, I'm saying as adoption grows. I mean, again, look at my Internet example 27 years ago. It was a bunch of libertarians complaining about the government. It's not that anymore. Now it's, uh, you know, every every communist and socialist, you know, I mean, I go on YouTube, every every half, every other video I see is somebody saying we need to end capitalism. And, uh, you know, we have to take away everyone's freedoms. Um, it wasn't that many, many years ago because the early adopters were very libertarian. And as adoption grows, you bring in people who are you know not going to be as, as friendly to maybe the, the core principles. This is the debate that I see as, a, as a, someone who works around the crypto space but isn't in it, which is. Uh, you have people who are calling for more regulation. I had Michael Saylor on uh, a while back and he says, yeah, we should have some regulations. Then you have people say, leave us the hell alone. You know, where, you know, wh where do we go with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the crypto, uh, the, Monero, the Monero community is actually, uh, I, would, I would consider one of the more pure, purest communities uh, with their ideology. Um, privacy and all that. Yeah. Privacy and all that. Uh, creating a technology that doesn't care what regulations exist. The idea is building something that's essentially unstoppable, uh, and doesn't matter what what governments, uh, regulators, or uh, anybody tries to do. The the protocol will work as intended, and you, you can't stop people from holding their own money privately and sending it without censorship and or anybody uh, being able to surveil. My concern, I mean, and again, not being not being the expert that you are, my concern, I look at the old school world of people saying, I have tangible assets, I'm going to put them in a trust. I'm going to put them in the most, you know, robust offshore trust I can find. And you've seen numerous examples where, you know, people put these assets in a Cook Islands trust. Either they put their, their house in the U.S. in the trust and the judge in the, in the U.S. says, we don't care what the trust says. The trust won't give us the asset, but we want the assets and we'll take it. Or the person stayed in, the, in their country and then the person, well, great, we'll just put you in jail. Um, you know, obviously, some people are very uh, uh, private about it. But, um, you know, for me, I, I, I just I never felt comfortable in the U.S. with the direction that it's going. And now you have so many people in the U.S. that just it's like you shouldn't have any money basically. Um, so that concerns me if I'm in a space like crypto that, uh, especially if I'm, if I'm seeing these remarkable uh, gains, um, that would concern me. But, but for sure, I mean, I think it's, it's very powerful. Do you think uh, the United States government uh, and any other governments you, you can comment on uh, are going to amp up their regulations on crypto and in Monero in particular? Monero is one of these more disruptive uh, currencies for the reasons we're talking about. It is, you know, untraceable. So they're, they're concerned about anti, anti money laundering or a money laundering. They're concerned about, you know, uh, taxes. Uh, what, what is your opinion there? Um, given what, what you know about the United States today and, and some other countries. Again, I mean, I'm not a legislative prognosticator and I don't, I don't follow every law that they're pushing through, but uh, I mean, there's one thing we know about the United States. They like to pass laws. I mean, you come to some of the smaller countries that I've talked about for years, you look at the, 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 the law book, basically. I mean, it pales in comparison. Um, and so, you know, my, my estimation is, uh, you know, politicians in the U.S., they want to regulate more. I mean, just look at the direction. Look at some of the biggest voices, the Elizabeth Warrens, the Bernie Sanders. I mean, these people have a great voice. These people are gaining traction. Uh, everything they talk about is wanting to take more of your money. And yes, the guys that they use... I, I often hypothesize, are they just really dumb or are they just purposefully, uh, you know, inefficient? Um, I, I think there's only, I, I think no matter who's in charge and no matter what happens, Western countries like more regulations, like more laws to them. That's what is success. And unfortunately, there are a couple of countries that are kind of like on the edge of Europe, for example, 
where they're like, well, maybe the path to becoming Sweden is lots of laws and high taxes. They don't realize that's not what the path is. But uh, yeah, I think that Western countries are going to put in more more regulations. I think they're going to crack down, and the, and and you know the guys will be money laundering. Uh, the guys will be criminality. Uh, it doesn't matter to them what happens at HSBC with the cartels and all that. Those are their friends. Um, and, and so this is where I see when you say uh, wider adoption. What happens with wider adoption? Does there become a crypto lobby? A whole contingent of lobbyists, you know, going and it's like, uh, I, I, I think you'll see more. I think you do have states in the U.S. who are trying to be crypto friendly, but it's the same problem you have in the marijuana industry. If the federal government, you know, sets the policies, and it's the same. Same reason I see in my business, you know, moving to Calif from California to Nevada to save tax, you're only saving 15% of the taxes. So, you know, overall, uh, you know, I voted with my feet, my opinion on the future of the U.S. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to collapse that the U.S. dollar is going to be, uh, you know, lose 99% of its value overnight. But uh, I, I don't believe in it a lot. And I put my money where my mouth is. So as the U.S. seemingly trends that direction, uh, what countries do you see trending in perhaps the opposite direction uh, as offering a, a competitive uh, choice? Uh, so uh, we, we, you mentioned some of them obviously already, uh, but are there, are there any in particular that you think are perhaps trending in the direction of being uh, more liberty-loving, more crypto-friendly, uh, that see that as an asset, as a way to uh, bring in, uh, you know, more people that, that that align with those values. Well, I mean, obviously you've seen what's happened in El Salvador, but I, I think that, you know, that's a good prototype of a country. I mean, uh, smaller countries, why? Number one, they're more flexible. They can turn on a dime. And I'm seeing this, you know, my own organization, it's really requires more effort to make sure that you're flexible in an organization that has 50 people versus one that has five people. Now, Blow that up to the scale of a, of a government with 300 plus million people. Um, so, you know, I just think Western countries beyond their desire not to change and their self-righteousness uh, will find it harder to change. And so in El Salvador can move pretty quickly where I'm at in Georgia, um, you know, has some potential. Uh, any kind of smaller country like that, Eastern Europe, I mean, look at personal freedom. Mexico has been great. Serbia has been pretty good. Um, you know, those have been places that have stood out. On the tax front, look at the last year and a half. You have so many governments around the world saying we need higher taxes to pay for this. Who came out and said no? Malaysia. We're not going to bring back a wealth tax. Why would we do that? Uruguay. We're not going to raise taxes. That would be dumb. Uh, Costa Rica uh, was not looking good for a while. The IMF, was, I guess, was pushing them to implement uh, you know, taxation on worldwide income for people who live there. Uh, for the time being, that's not going to come in. So, I mean... I think those are positive signs. And I think smaller countries are more capable of being nimble. I mean, look at countries that came out. Like, I mean, it wasn't the Prince of Liechtenstein that came out and said, yeah, we like cryptocurrency. You're not going to see the president of the United States say that. So I think that smaller countries generally have that flexibility. And then you've seen you know, places like Mexico where it's been very uh, pleasantly surprising to see the government say, yeah, we're in favor of personal freedom. Yeah. The challenge is the personal freedom and the tax freedom going together. You know, some are only in one basket, so you have to work that out. I mean, it's, you're kind of getting one or the other, you're saying? You can get both. Um, but, you know, Mexico, kind of a weird tax system. But if you're going to live full time in Mexico in the long term, you know, that's going to be more on the tax issue. But, you know, my impression is, you know, very high levels of personal freedom. There's also what I say, soft liberty versus hard liberty. You know, people in the U.S., they talk about the Constitution, which is increasingly not even followed there was a seizure of a bunch of people's private safe deposit boxes recently. The judge said you can't go in there. And the FBI just literally did it anyway. They don't. Who, who cares about judges? Who cares about the Constitution? But people say, OK, it's it's in it's, it's shrouded in the law. You know, you go to other countries, you know, they just don't bother you know, half the time. And so, you know, if you haven't lived in these places, that is a difference to be experienced. How about the responses to, to COVID that we're seeing in different countries? Um, do you think that's kind of exposing uh, which which countries are perhaps more liberty loving than others, uh, and and sh and uh, basically giving some countries an opportunity to once again showcase themselves as a place that might be more desirable for for personal freedoms? Sure, I mean I think we're seeing that Asia, and by Asia I'm even including some of the Middle East, um, rather technocratic, um, you know, is going to follow things in terms of, you know, vaccines and things like that. You've seen Latin America, which I think is much more uh, 
I don't know, let's use the word sensual, perhaps. I don't know what the what the word is, but you know, people uh, you know people like to protest, um, and that's been more open. You know, I think that my situation, I haven't had any problems. Um, I haven't been stuck inside since April of 2020. Um, I was in Malaysia at the time. I found it to be pretty flexible. Certainly, things were closed down at the height of things, but things opened back up. And uh, I haven't been back to Malaysia in a while, but when I was there, it was pretty well functioning. And then I left for Eastern Europe, um, in Serbia, Montenegro, Turkey. Then I was in Colombia. Then I was in Mexico. I mean, the restrictions that I faced are very minimal, if not non-existent. And so I've been traveling pretty freely from country to country. Um, you know, I'm not going to Canada. I'm not going to Australia. I'm not going to Germany. Um, and so for me, you know, the world is a world beyond the West. In a sense, it's sad. Uh, in a sense, I wish I could go into a, uh, you know, to a cafe in London and, and joke with the barista or into a restaurant and you know, have a more meaningful conversation. But, you know, I've adapted to do that with people who are in my, in my personal life and in my business, um, because what's sad is irrelevant. Um, the Western world is increasingly totalitarian. There are certainly some other parts of the world that have shown that. Um, what I will say is this. I do work with people who say, you know what? I signed up and I got the vaccine and uh, I wanted the vaccine. And I think that's you know a matter of it's a, it's a good thing to do. OK, well, there are places for them, too, that believe, uh, hey, listen, we're not going to force people to do things, but we're pushing the vaccine. So I, I think that, um, you know, freedom is what you define it. And I think we're seeing that everyone's going to have their place. Yeah, it's. Uh, do, do you see things getting? I mean, I know these these are obviously tough questions. Uh, these are the the biggest questions of the day. Um, do you see things getting getting worse, or have we have we peaked out in terms of hmm. uh, what, the gover what governments are doing with their response to COVID? I mean, it seemed like you know a year ago there was a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, but now it's 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 still the the top conversation of the day. Uh, it's it's moved from vaccines to now everybody needs to get their their booster shot. Uh, everybody, you know, in certain places, you know, you need to get your vaccine, get your booster, and still wear your mask. Um, do you think this is something that's going to continue for some time uh, in different parts of the world? Uh, where where do you see this trending, or do you think uh, there'll be some some countries that take the lead and and start to trend the other way as as saying, all right, we're 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 kind of done with this, we're moving on with life. Uh, how, how do you look at that? Well, I mean, Singapore came out and said we're going to stop counting case numbers. Now, I mean, there's certainly still a bit of you can't go to Singapore. Uh, at least everybody can't. Um, but they came out and said they were going to do that. Um, listen, I mean, 9/11 is coming up. 20 years. You're still taking your shoes off at the airport. No, I'm not um, in most airports I go to, but you know, you can fly to the US 20 years later. I mean, um, I think that what this is, it's the government version of when you get on the plane and the pilot says, oh, we just need 10 more minutes. We're gonna fix something up, we'll be on our way. And they feed you that 10 minutes for about two hours and then they cancel your flight. People like being delivered things in 10 minute doses or in micro doses, and that makes it more palatable. I mean, look at Joe Biden, July 4th, we're back to normal. Uh, you know, sorry. It's this hot and cold that I think governments like as it maintains their power, it creates chaos. Um, I think that while the countries that I'm in are not perfect, there's been there's more of a reality. I mean, if you don't control the US dollar, you can't just print your way into quote unquote wealth. You know, these countries need to survive. And I think there's a greater understanding of that. You know, for me, I look at countries like a business. If you go to a sushi restaurant and the service sucks and the food is terrible, you're not going to keep going back to that restaurant. And I think some countries have some, at least in a political sense, understanding of that more than the big countries, which are more like people are just going to eat here anyway, whether it's good or not. And so I think that's that's very you know worth thinking about. Uh, I think what this, this is exposed is what I always would have said. There's no perfect place. I think it'll probably continue for the foreseeable future. Um, I guess in a sense, I always knew it would go on for some time when it began, as much as I wanted to think it wouldn't be a huge issue. And as long as I, as much as I didn't really want to adapt my life to it, and I haven't largely adapted, but I, I think that they'll probably try and drag it out for a while longer. I would say this, keep in mind in Asia, people were always wearing masks when they were sick at least. So masks were, I think there's more understanding of masks in Asia than perhaps other parts of the world.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, the uh, the ratchet effect, right? So it, it becomes hard to to ratchet it back. Uh, jumping back to crypto, when we when we spoke about it before, you, you mentioned things like like gold and silver as being alternative investments, uh, things that you that 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 interests you. Do you do you see crypto uh, as uh, a store of value, as digital gold, as it's often uh, being portrayed as, particularly in the Bitcoin community? Do you do you view it that way? Well, you know, I haven't really thought what I view it about. I mean, I guess I use it that way is part of the portfolio. So in that way, you know, I guess I do. I'm a big believer in we, we vote with our feet. We're all doing what we want. Right. And so uh, I suppose that I do. Um, yeah. And uh, just do you have a, any uh, particular opinion of Monero itself? Are you are you? cognizant of Monero obviously Bitcoin everybody knows Bitcoin um, do you have you ever taken a good look at close look at Monero this is the Monero show so I'm trying to I'm trying to find yeah, if uh, a, a liberty loving person such as yourself has has discovered Monero for all the, the liberty offerings it, it has Monero um, I think we've held some Monero at, at various times I can't say it's a huge thing that we're doing maybe it should maybe you're gonna inspire me quite frankly that's what's happened over the course of crypto is I talk to different people and they inspire me to get a different things and um, maybe that'll happen we have worked with people who have Monero and so I understand that capacity I understand that the, the, the idea you know when you ask about the freedom piece I'm probably I mean I think we I think that the key takeaway here is we all want to define what freedom means for us obviously you know to a large percentage of the people, I guess, I'm, I'm conspiratorial or I'm no good or I'm selfish or whatever else. Probably a lot more of those people. There's also people where I'm like, all right, I don't, go, I don't quite take it that far. I think for me, I think, I think Monero is very interesting. I also kind of think you know, I'm in perhaps a bit of a different position. Privacy is very important. For me, just disconnecting with the US was a, was a great increase in my privacy. So I think it's probably time to evaluate, you know, as I've been increasing privacy in the business, as we've been increasing, you know, physical privacy mechanisms, uh, you know, looking at something like Monero. But, you know, for me, uh, the last couple of years have been a great feeling of, I don't have to file a tax return with anybody. I don't have to like report all my stuff anymore. And so it's a little bit different, but, you know, I think there's always room for improvement. Mm. Do you see it as uh, potentially being this kind of Swiss bank for, for the, the, you know, this generation and upcoming generations, crypto taking taking on the role of, of being the new Swiss bank or the new offshore bank account? Yeah, I mean, potentially, listen, I, you know, for, for us, offshore banking is always about legal ways to diversify your cash so that, you know, if you get sued by somebody, you have at least money to defend yourself. Or if the government comes after you, you have a way to defend yourself. And because, listen, sometimes people come after you and you do nothing wrong and you've got to defend yourself. Uh, or, you know, other legal reasons, diversification, what have you. Uh, it was never about hiding money. That was always illegal. It has become, in this information age, much more difficult. Uh, but, you know, it's, I don't think it's something that everyone would have advised. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, for me, the position, the, the point is putting yourself in a position where um, you're not as concerned uh, and so in my mind, the, if we go back to the Wolf of Wall Street style, you know, Swiss banking, illegally hiding money, uh, it's a lot less necessary for someone who has, you know, multiple citizenships at places that don't really care, don't want to bother you, don't have taxes at all. I think it's I think that's the, the kind of macro perspective that I look at this from. For sure. I think the answer to your question is, you know, crypto, perhaps Monero in, in, in general or in, in particular are uh, are the Swiss bank. I think the question is, you know, why do we need a Swiss bank? And for me, uh, you know, I don't want to live in a system where, um, you know, I'm always worried about what could happen next. So I would say craft your life in a way that allows that. Monero fits into that. Uh, you're just one step ahead. All right. I guess uh, last last question. Um, where. Where do you see things trending in terms of this nomad capitalist uh, movement, um, which you're very much a big part of? Uh, yeah. is, is it growing? Obviously, I, I think it is. Um, I, I look at your subscriber and you have hundreds of thousands of YouTube subscribers. Uh, like I said, I think, I think crypto very much, the crypto movement very much aligns with these ideals as well. 
where do you see wh where is it going towards? I mean, are, are we just going to see more and more no nomad capitalists, so to speak? And what is that? How is that going to affect uh, the current dynamic that we see between states? Is there going to be kind of this third category? Uh, like you said, I mean, currently right now, there really is no way to be stateless or you can, but it's it doesn't really work. It's not very practical. Uh, do we begin to, does that begin to actually become a practical option where there's this stateless, uh, new, 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 new way of essentially being stateless and you can function in the world, uh, fluidly, um, and, uh, as a nomad capitalist, is it, is it going to become easier to be a nomad capitalist? Where do you see it? What do you see it trending towards? In the statelessness, I mean, there's some interesting things. I mean, I think it's definitely the pioneer days of that. You know, I'm friends with uh, V. Lichke from, from Lieberland and you know, some of the seasteading guys. I mean, you know, it's an interesting space. Um, you know, I'm not ready to go out and live in the, in the sea. Um, but you know, I think that's very interesting, you know, pioneer day stuff. And I'm supportive of it. And let's see. Uh, I think you're absolutely going to see a lot more nomad capitalists uh, because, Taxes have nowhere to go but up. Now, again, um, I'm known as the tax guy, the lower your taxes guy. Um, as I said, my first impetus to get out was not that. But, you know, people tend to do things for economic reasons. Somebody who's sitting around saying, I'm having a hard time finding a date. They might have a much easier time finding a date in Russia or in Indonesia, but that might be the, the push that they need to, to move. So the economics, I think, are what moves more people. And in that regard, I mean, taxes uh, are going to go up. Regulations are going to go up. Um, and I know that because the culture, and it's what I've been talking about and hearing about for, for 25 years. The culture is uh, now coming down to how dare you be a landlord? Uh, how dare you have anything? Why don't, if I'm paying rent, why don't I own your house? Uh, just basic cluelessness about um, economic concepts. I mean, this is what the Western world is today. Um, if you read the fourth turning, I mean, you have a lot of chaos in the Western world uh, to come. And so I think that people are going to want to go where they're treated best. Those are the five magic words. Um, and I think that's how it always works. People naturally go where they're treated best. It's just how it works. The only question is, do people believe there's somewhere better? And uh, I'm here to tell you that I think there absolutely is. And that's, that's being a nomad capitalist. Yeah, I think so. All right, Andrew, greatly appreciate you taking the time. Where can people learn more about you or possibly uh, hire you for, for consulting to take that leap toward being a nomad? So we just uh, are republishing the second version of the book, Nomad Countless on Amazon. It's a good way to learn some stories, pick up on the vibe, kind of everything aggregated into one book for a, uh, a low price. Um, it's uh, a lot of free content on YouTube, on our website, nomadcapitalist.com. So just nomad capitalists everywhere. Uh, what my approach to, to business is, it's very boutique. You know, we do something that's very unique, but we're basically putting the pieces of you know, 10, 12, 13 different categories together for folks, rather than them going to five or six or 10 different people. Uh, we have those people, we have the inside knowledge, uh, but it's not like I can just go in and hire 100 people to do that. So we run a boutique operation. Uh, we create plans for people that cover all the boxes. So if you come and you tell me your seven objectives, you know, we're going to work around those uh, with a one-stop shop. And you can learn more at uh, nomadcapitalist.com. Just click on the big green button at the top of the page and uh, you'll get all the info you need. Do you hold conferences as well? Is that, is that right? we, we did have, yeah. You know, I had conferences years ago and uh, you know, our first keynote was Peter Schiff. Not so uh, popular, I guess, in the crypto community, but um we did have Nomad Capitalist Live a couple months ago. We had Doug Casey there who wrote The International Man, very, very, really smart guy. Uh, President Mikhail Saakashvili of Georgia, um, you know, a lot of other uh, great speakers. Um, Robert Kiyosaki was there um, from Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So that was kind of fun. That was a great way because I'll tell you, uh, what do people say? Great content. Um, but really great people. Even Robert Kiyosaki, he's like, I'm, I'm staying longer. I thought I was just going to give a speech and go home. This is like the best group of people ever. Because I think a lot of us, whether you're in crypto, whether you're in my space, they do some of our lab. Um, people want to meet other people who think the way that they do. And, um, you know, that's important. And so that was really a fun thing as well. Uh, yeah. If you ever think there's an opportunity for, uh, 
somebody to come and talk about Monero, please, please let me know. Uh, we could get somebody from the community over there. I think uh, there is a lot of overlap, as you're saying. I think uh, a lot of the people that are interested in being a, a nomad uh, should be aware of Monero if they're not already for, for all its uh, liberty. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to certainly look more into it after, after this conversation because I always want to know what's going on. I think it's very interesting. So I, I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, I guess the biggest biggest uh, thing to know about Monero essentially is that it's uh, the anonymous, untraceable version of Bitcoin is, is kind of my short elevator pitch, which usually peaks a lot of people's ears when I tell them that because people say, well, was it, isn't Bitcoin already anonymous and untraceable? Most people don't realize that it's not. So uh, that, that, that's, that's my, my, uh, my quick elevator pitch to, bit, to Monero. Well, I you have any you have any Monero questions while I have you here. Uh, happy happy <laughs> to hear any that you might have. Well, I, I think we'll have to look into it more. But okay. I'll, you know, yeah. How's that? yeah, take a look. Let me know if you have any questions. Happy to uh, if you ever want me to jump on your show or wh whatever. Or like I said, if you ever want somebody to attend one of your conferences, uh, it's it's definitely a uh, you know a technology that I think uh, nomads of the future will will want to. Uh, be aware of. Absolutely. All right, Matt. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks so much. All right. Have a good one. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.